Another equally valid assumption is that the bulk of this water is truly lunar, and that some lunar water is not too different in isotopic composition from the terrestrial water. For many reasons, we favor this view. The oxygen-18 of the water extracted from rock 66095 at temperatures from 25 degrees Celsius to 400 degrees Celsius resembles the oxygen-18 of lunar silicates from rock 66095, and is appreciably enriched in oxygen-18 by comparison with terrestrial water vapor and water extracted from the samples of terrestrially formed rust. Of course, it could be pointed out that the oxygen-18 of lunar silicates is within the same range as terrestrial rocks. The Lunar Sample Compendium, which covers both reports by both parties, points out that the deuterium to oxygen-18 values are not different for those of Earth. Charles Mayer writes, Epstein and Taylor and Friedman's team carefully studied the temperature release and isotopic composition of H2O released from 66095. Samples of 66095 were found to have more H2O than any other rock sample, and somewhat more H2O than any lunar soil. However, isotopic analysis indicated that the deuterium and oxygen-18 were similar to that of terrestrial water. In summary, Taylor and Epstein and Friedman's team respectively studied water of sample 66095. The former found deuterium and oxygen-18 to be the same as earth water, leading them to believe it was contamination. The latter found oxygen-18 to be the same as that as the rock which incidentally is the same as terrestrial rocks, and concluded that the water was of lunar origin. Towards the end of their paper, Friedman's team acknowledged their disagreement with Taylor and Epstein over whether or not the water is terrestrial. They maintain that their position is the correct one. Epstein and Taylor have reported they did not detect oxygen-18 in their aliquot of sample 66095, and they conclude that the water in this lunar rock is terrestrial. We do not know the reason for the apparent disagreement between their results and ours, since we use two different techniques to extract the water for analysis with similar results, we do not believe that our experimental techniques can be the problem. Epstein and Taylor analyzed samples that had been stored for a year longer than ours, perhaps exchange with terrestrial water occurred during this period. The positions of our respective samples in the original lunar boulder from which the astronauts broke off sample 66095 may be important. In spite of the excellence of the data of Epstein and Taylor, we believe that our analysis and conclusions must remain unchanged. So it seems, hydrous minerals do exist in the Apollo samples, and the scientists who find them are at war over whether or not they too were the result of contamination. Ironically enough, even the Lunar Sample Compendium casts doubt on the terrestrial contamination excuse. In the paperwork for this rock, we are told, It is possible that anhydrous metal salts, chlorides, in 66095 combined with the moisture in the Lunar Module, Command Module, Tropical Pacific and or Individual Terrestrial Laboratory, yielding terrestrial-like hydrogen and oxygen isotopic signatures. However, it is difficult to see how moisture penetrated into the sample to rust the interior metal grains. Secondly, the containers used to house the Lunar Rocks are vacuum sealed and were only opened in vacuum chambers. There is no way on Earth that water could have gotten in. The containers had to be vacuum sealed, not only for the sake of avoiding contamination in the first place, but also, prior to Apollo 11, there was major concern, especially from Dr. Thomas Gold, that any lunar dust trodden into the lunar module, or not secured, would begin floating around in the cabin once zero gravity was regained. Thirdly, in a vacuum, the boiling point of water is drastically lowered below 26 degrees Celsius. The daylight temperatures on the moon are over 100 degrees Celsius. Under those conditions, any water exposed to these rocks would have instantly boiled away. In April 2010, I attended and filmed a lecture at Macquarie University by Dr. Fred Watson the astronomer in charge at the Australian Astronomical Observatory, formerly the Anglo-Australian Observatory. 
It was here that I learned that subsequent to the discovery of water in the spherules and other studies, scientists now believe that the water they have constantly attributed to contamination may in fact be of lunar origin. When the lecture was over, Dr. Watson and an assistant were having a discussion about moon rocks. I overheard this while waiting to ask him my questions. The camera was still rolling. The following clip is what was said during that discussion. And yes, Dr. Watson has given me permission to use this. As he put it, quote away. But there is something else, Katie. Mm -hmm. the, all the rock samples and soil samples, the 380 kilograms that came back yeah. from the following mission, yeah. Yeah. they all contain water. And everybody assumed that it was terrestrial contamination. Oh. Um, but recent results have shown that it's actually the hydrogen's got a slightly different isotopic oh, okay. composition. That's so it probably is genuine yeah. moon water. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. That, that, that was the first thing I thought of. Was just, why are they throwing things at it now when yeah. they were already up there? Well, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, we, we know so much more now. That the, the moon rocks are all being reanalyzed because the technology they had mm. back in 1970 71, 72, mm. um, it was far less than what there is now for analysing rock and yeah. soil samples. Okay. So, so we might learn new things actually. Yeah. Stuff. <laughs> yes. yeah. There might be life up there, but not, well, not as we know yeah, it. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I think it would be not as we know it. While this conversation took place in April 2010, the results Watson was talking about were apparently not published until January 2011. Although the March 9th, 2010 issue of Nature did carry some brief passing mentions on hydrogen isotopes. The January 9th, 2011 issue of Nature Geoscience carried a study by James Greenwood and his team, who looked at the deuterium to hydrogen ratios of the water found in various Apollo samples. Deuterium, or hydrogen 2 as it's also called, is a hydrogen isotope in which a neutron is added to the hydrogen nucleus, which normally comprises of just a single proton. In this study, Greenwood places the deuterium for earth water within the range of minus 500 per mil to plus 100 per mil. They found that the deuterium of water in some of the samples deviates outside this range and is more comparable to the deuterium of comet water. The deuterium values of water in apatite grains from mare basalts 10044, 12039, and 75055 range from plus 391 per mil to plus 1010 per mil. These deuterium values are more deuterium enriched than any terrestrial water, and support the assertion that we have analyzed indigenous lunar water in these samples. More deuterium enriched than terrestrial water? I'm not sure about that. I found another paper on deuterium in lunar water, or at least an abstract of one. The full paper has not yet been published. It was written by Eric Hurry and his team, which incidentally includes the Alberto Sal who found the water in the spherules, and it is titled Hydrogen Isotope Similarity of the Earth and Moon Revealed by Water in Lunar Volcanic Glasses. I don't know all the details because the said paper is not yet published, but this abstract explicitly states The average deuterium of the five highest H2O glasses is plus 340 per mil. This deuterium range overlaps the range of carbonaceous chondrites and terrestrial water. As a result, within the uncertainties in our measurements and correction for the effects of cosmic ray spallation and degassing, we conclude that juvenile magmatic water in the lunar interior has a deuterium to hydrogen ratio that is indistinguishable from terrestrial water. This study is the first to identify a planetary body with a hydrogen isotope composition that is the same as the Earth. Well, I wouldn't say it's the first. Friedman's team and Epstein and Taylor has been reporting on the deuterium to hydrogen ratios identical to that of Earth since the 1970s. Anyway, the 330 per mil deuterium for the spheral water and terrestrial water is comparable to the lower end of the range that Greenwood applies to the water in Lunar Maria samples. If this figure overlaps the range for terrestrial water, that means the deuterium in Earth water must be around minus 500 per mil to positive 340 per mil. This is higher than what Greenwood applies to terrestrial water, and the lower end of the Lunar Maria range is no longer looking so different from its terrestrial counterpart. 
Now, because the higher end of the range is comparable to deuterium of comet water, this has led Greenwood and others to conclude that the water in the Apollo samples is in fact comet water. Even if we overlook the pitfalls of just how long any water can last during the daylight hours in the moon's equatorial regions, the premise is still flawed. While the deuterium of some of the lunar water may be similar to that of comets, proponents of the comet water delivery theory seem to have overlooked the fact that the oxygen isotopes of comets are not in any way similar to those of the Apollo rocks. In fact, as was evidenced by samples retrieved by the Stardust mission, we know that the oxygen 18 to oxygen 17 ratios of comets is more along the lines of carbonaceous chondrites. Ironically enough, one of Greenwood's co-investigators, Larry Taylor, was quoted along these lines in the 2009 Space.com article. The isotopes of oxygen that exist on the moon are the same as those that exist on Earth. So it was difficult, if not impossible, to tell the difference between water from the moon and water from Earth. We can rule out the theory that the water in the Apollo samples came from comets due to the plain simple fact that the water in the Apollo samples has oxygen isotope ratios identical to the Earth and the water of comets doesn't. This will become important later on. Interestingly, Greenwood goes on to state, The deuterium enrichment of the Earth's oceans relative to the Earth's mantle could result from such an early addition of cometary water to the Earth. In the earlier article from Nature, co-author Larry Taylor is quoted along these lines. This ratio came as a surprise. The moon is thought to have formed when a Mars-sized body hit Earth soon after its formation, melting much of the planet and flinging up molten rock that eventually coalesced and hardened to form a satellite. That picture suggests that the Earth and the moon should have started with similar ratios of heavy water. But the markedly heavier mix of water in the lunar samples has forced researchers to consider alternative explanations. One idea, Taylor says, is that a bevy of comets struck the moon soon after the giant impact responsible for its formation, and that the heavy comet water mixed into the moon's magma ocean. The comets would have struck Earth too, but because the young planet had a significantly larger supply of water, the heavy water deposited on Earth was greatly diluted. If the deuterium-rich water from these fake moon samples is indeed from comets, it looks as though all the comet water on Earth was not diluted as well as we think. Interestingly, this Nature Geoscience article puts an even much, much higher content of water that was reported in 1970. These guys report the water to be around 6,050 ppm. So let's recap. When the samples supposedly returned from the moon, Friedman and his team discovered around 150 to 455 ppm of water within the actual rock, which they state is akin to freshly erupted Hawaiian basalts, and another 810 ppm in the lunar dust. Meanwhile, Agrel and his team discovered the rock samples they analysed contained water as high as 1500 ppm. Both groups of people doubted that this water was terrestrial contamination, and insisted that it had been there to begin with. But NASA maintained that it was contamination, despite the fact that the rocks also contained secondary minerals, which was also blamed on contamination. Then in 2008, Alberto Sal and his team detected 46 parts per million inside the glass spherules, and estimate that around 240 to 745 ppm of water exists in these beads. Knowing that there is no way contamination-induced water could have got inside, this subsequently led scientists to conclude that maybe the water they previously found may not be contamination at all. What Phil Webb ignores, of course, is the fact that this new finding invalidates the explanation that has always been given for the similarities between Earth rocks and Moon rocks. Analysis of the Moon rocks showed that they were almost identical to rocks from the Earth's mantle, with the major difference being the alleged lack of water. This led William Hartman to propose the Giant Impact Theory. This was discussed in my Exhibit D series.